story about a little Baptist church down in Arkansas who decided to celebrate Pentecost in a very special way. And as the congregation filed in the church that Sunday morning, the ushers handed each person a bright red carnation to symbolize the special and festivity of the day. The people listened attentively to the reading of the Pentecost story from the book of Acts about how the disciples had heard what was like a powerful wind from heaven about how the Holy Spirit had descended uh, from the heavens and appeared like tongues of fire. And then came the sermon. The Spirit of the Lord is upon us, the preacher began, like the powerful wind from heaven. A woman shouted from the first seat, yes, like the powerful wind from heaven. The preacher began again. The Spirit of the Lord is upon us. The same woman's voice rang out again, like the tongues of fire, like the tongues of fire. She threw a red carnation at the pulpit. The preacher said, the Holy Ghost is here. She said, yea, Lord, the Holy Ghost is here, and threw another carnation at the altar. The preacher looked straight at her and said, now throw your pocketbook. <laughs> <laughs> to which the woman required, preacher, you have just calmed the wind and put out the fire. <laughs> In today's gospel lesson, Jesus talks about Pentecost and explains why this great event had to take place. Pentecost was actually nothing new to the Jews of that day. It was a feast day, Shavuot, celebrating 50 days after Passover to give thanks for the first fruits of the earth. The word Pentecost is of Greek origin. Pentecost day himmel, roughly translated as the 50th day. And so indeed there were a large crowd of people milling about when suddenly the scriptures tell us there was a sound from heaven like a mighty rushing wind. Now we can imagine that that was not unlike a clap of thunder in the summertime followed by a strong gust of wind and then the bottom falls out. But unlike a summertime squall, fire from heaven rained down. And the scriptures tell us they were filled with the Holy Spirit. Now, it's important that we pay close attention to that phrase, filled with the Holy Ghost or filled with the Holy Spirit. Suddenly, you see, it all began to make sense. Now, I'm sure all of us have had an experience where everything just seemed to come together. I mean, you remember learning to ride a bicycle? I recall my father pushing me off and wobbling about, and after a while I finally began to understand the importance of balance and the necessity of, to keep on pedaling and steering in the right direction. But you see, it all came together. My granddaughter Madeline has been trying to learn to do cartwheels and flips and headstands and all those gymnastic things that kids do. And so this finally, this past week, she was so excited that she was able to finally do a complete body flip. For Madeline, you see, it all came together. She began to put together the right move combined with the correct balance to complete that particular and so it was with the disciples. We read over and over again for the past few weeks just how Jesus tried to prepare his followers for what was going to happen. He promised them a comforter, someone who would help them to understand. <coughs> now that is the change that took place on that day of Pentecost. They were no longer confused. They understood at last his plan of salvation. They were no longer timid and afraid. Now it was clear they understood and they could speak out with confidence. Let's look at Peter, for example. A couple of months earlier, fearing for his life, he denied that he even knew Jesus Christ. 
not once, but three times. And if we read a few verses past the epistle lesson for today, we read of Peter's sermon to the men of Judea where he established himself as leader of this new church. And so you see, that was the first change that took place on this day of Pentecost. Christ's followers at last understood what the ministry of Jesus Christ was all about, and they were ready to carry forth the commission that he had given them. Now the second change was even more powerful. As a result of Peter's sermon, the church began to grow. Verse 40 of Acts chapter 2 tells us, And that with many other words he exhorted them, saying, Be saved from this perverse generation. And those who gladly received his word were baptized. And that day about 3,000 souls were added to them. From this little band of followers that numbered in the hundred, suddenly 3,000 more were added. And that, my friends, is real church growth. So two important things took place on that day of Pentecost. The disciples understood what their mission was to be, and they started on that mission right away. That's what Pentecost is all about. Change. How the Holy Spirit coming into our lives can completely change us into different men and women. And most of us don't want to change. It's just human nature. We resist change. Our philosophy is I'm all right the way I am. And I think that's especially true as we get older. We often have the opinion that just because we've survived for 65 years or more, we did everything right. Wrong. Maybe God's gracious mercy and protection had something to do with that. But generally speaking, most people don't like change. They fear change, and they're resistant to change. story about a man who went to the doctor. I was really, really feeling lousy. And so after a thorough examination, the doctor said, listen, said, you are in terrible shape. You are in precarious shape, and if we don't make some changes here, you're going to die. You've got to do something about this. He said, first of all, you've got to inform your wife that she's got to cook more nutritious meals. And then you're going to have to tell her that her spending habits are driving you crazy and she's going to have to make a budget and learn to live within it. And then you're going to have to tell her when you come home at night, she's going to have to keep the kids quiet so you can have some rest. The man thought about that for a minute and said, Doc, I don't know. The doctor said, listen, if you don't do what I'm telling you, you're going to be dead in 30 days. I said, listen. I don't think my wife's going to believe me when I tell her that. Maybe you ought to call her. The doctor said, okay, I'll call her. I said, no, this. The fellow got home that night. She rushed out, meeting him at the door, and said, honey, I talked to your doctor. Poor man, you only got 30 days to live. <laughs> <laughs> need to make changes in our physical and mental lives. Eat less, exercise more, expand our minds, and maybe we ought to inventory our spiritual lives as well. Maybe there are some sinful things in my life that I continue to cling to that I ought to get rid of. Maybe we still have moments when we're selfish. Do we still misunderstand what God is telling us through His Holy Scripture? There's still times when we're just too timid to tell others about the love of Jesus. There are many, many changes that all of us can make in our lives. But you simply cannot do that by just trying to be a better person. <coughs> Reverend 
Don Schultz says, just trying to be a better person is like saying there's something wrong with my car, but I'll try to change that by being a better driver. You need someone to work on your engine, your soul. But the thing that most of us don't understand is that our souls are far too complicated for us to fix ourselves. We need someone to fix it for us, and that someone is the Holy Spirit. Unfortunately, the Holy Spirit no longer comes to most of us with a mighty rush of wings and winds and, and tongues of fire. <coughs> the Spirit comes quietly through prayer. He comes when we acknowledge that we are hurting. He comes when we ask for repentance in a true sense. He comes when we know that we're doing things that are wrong and we sincerely want to change our broken, sinful lives into something better. If you look around our church today, you see that uh, there's a lot of red. Hot choir processing today, holding those wonderful red candles lit for a purpose. Red reminds us Jesus' blood that was shed as payment for our sins. Red reminds us of, of the fire that came down from heaven on the first day of Pentecost. And red should also remind us of the invisible fire of faith that burns inside each and every one of us. But it is a fire that must be rekindled from time to time by asking the Holy Spirit be a part of our lives. You know, the psychiatrists tell us that there are three things that we need in order to be happy. First of all, we need something to do. Secondly, we need something to love. And third, we need something to look forward to. The need to do something can be expressed in hundreds of different ways. From sailing a boat to crocheting a rope. But if Jesus Christ is not a part of that something, true satisfaction is not ever going to be mine. <clears throat> Love for something can usually be found by most people. But unfortunately, the love of money or drugs or whatever the passion may be doesn't love us anymore. Someone to love who returns that love is more valuable than any riches in the world. We have to understand that the love of God is always there for us. Finally, hope is what all of us have to look forward to. Without hope, there is no life. The hope that all of us must have is that of eternal life our Father in Heaven. You know, I've often thought just how overwhelming that day of Pentecost must have been to those simple apostles. And I can see this image of the most powerful God blowing, almost breathing the Holy Spirit into their lives as He breathed the life into those He first created. You know, power can be used in many ways. Sometimes it's simply unleashed, and sometimes it's harnessed. The energy, for example, in 10 gallons of gasoline can be released explosively by simply dropping a match into the can. Or it can be channeled through the engine of an automobile and used to transport a person hundreds of miles. The Holy Spirit works in both of those ways. At Pentecost, exploded on the scene. His presence was like tongues of fire. Thousands were affected by one burst of God's power. But because, because the institution of God, the church, began to tap into the Holy Spirit's power for the long haul, 
That same spirit works through the church today, quietly and effectively through worship and fellowship <laughs> and service. church now for over 2,000 years has been provided with staying power, thank God. And that staying power comes through the work of the Holy Spirit. I can tell you that I have seen the Holy Spirit at work so many lives. The change people nothing to something. To change a little man who are just looking for a place to worship into the house of God that is here where you worship the Holy Spirit is truly one of God's everlasting miracles. And for that, may we all.